Hello, my name is Stanford Gibson. I am the Sediment Transport Specialist on the HEC RAS development team, and this series of videos will introduce you to developing a mobile bed sediment transport model in HEC RAS. So this is the first of three videos that we're going to do to show you how to develop a sediment transport model from an HEC RAS geometry. This video will show you how to set up a quasi and steady flow file, and then we'll do the sediment data in the next video. So to run a sediment simulation, you need three data files, a geometry file, a flow file, and a sediment file. And then just like any other RAS model, you need a plan file to kind of pull those together. If you look at the data we give you, the folder includes data files and solution files. We have the solution that you can go in and look at as you're working through in there, but we're gonna open data files. And you'll see there are only two RAS files, a project file and a geometry file. So we're gonna assume you have a geometry file. Um, you can build this from a train in RAS Mapper, or more commonly, you already have a geometry file from a steady or unsteady fixed bed RAS model. One of the advantages of doing sediment transport in RAS is that it's pretty likely that a RAS model already exists for your system, and you can leverage that to build the sediment model on top of an existing, hopefully high quality geometry file. And so we're going to start with the geometry file, and in this video, we'll learn how to make the quasi unsteady flow file, and in the next video, it'll be the sediment data file. Now you can run a sediment transport model with either quasi and steady flow, which models the hydrograph as a series of steady flows, or in the full unsteady flow mode. But quasi and steady mode tends to be more stable, so we use it more often for sediment transport. I'll do another video later on how and when to use unsteady sediment transport. And so what we're going to do is we're going to open the file. We'll go to RAS. Of course, you can go to File, Open, or you can press the Open button. and we're going to go to, I put it here under sediment demo one, data files, and I'm going to open the project file. And so it automatically brings in the geometry file, which you can get to through edit geometric data or by pushing the schematic button. And you'll see that it brings up the geometry file of a 1D model, which is just a series of cross sections. Now this is a totally fictional river. This river does not exist in the real world, so please do not use it for research or planning purposes. It is purely for demonstration. The next thing we're gonna do is we're going to create a quasi and steady flow file for our sediment transport. We'll close out of the geometry file and we'll open the quasi and steady flow file. So if you go to edit quasi and steady flow, which is indicated for sediment analysis, or if you push the middle of the three flow models, it'll open up quasi unsteady flow editor, which actually, if you have unsteady flow experience, looks a lot like the unsteady flow editor. And then the data we're going to use is this Excel file called tutorial data. So we'll just open that as well. And so you can see we have a hydrograph that's about 100 days in 1975. Again, totally fictional. And so we're going to enter this flow into the quasi unsteady flow editor. Any HEC RAS model regardless of the flow mode, needs boundary conditions at any upstream and any downstream boundary condition. And so you can see the quasi and steady flow editor automatically populates two boundary conditions, an upstream and a downstream boundary condition. And if you plot on the upstream boundary condition and the downstream boundary condition, you'll see that different buttons are available for different features. So let's start with the upstream boundary condition. The only available upstream boundary condition for a sediment transport model in quasi and steady flow is a flow series. So we're going to go in and open the flow series. And the flow series editor looks a lot like the unsteady flow editor, if you've seen it. But in sediment transport, because we have long periods where not a lot happens and then short periods where an awful lot happens, we allow users to use irregular time steps. And so you can see our data is daily data. And so the duration of each of our time steps is going to be 24 hours. And so we're going to go in and just put 24 in for all the durations. Now, it's just lucky that we have 100 flows and 100 durations. We can just put them in all of our rows. But if we were to say have, I don't know, 365 or um, 40,000, we could go into a number of ordinance and increase our number of rows up to 40,000. And so we can either come in here and type in 24, and then if we hover over the bottom right-hand corner, we get these crosshairs where we can drag it down and fill things out. Or if we put one at the top and one at the bottom and press interpolate, we can fill the whole plot. All right, so now we have daily time steps. Now we can put in our flows, 
And so we'll go here and press Control shift down to get all of the flows in Excel and control C to copy them. And we'll come over here to RAS and paste them in. Okay, so we have flow durations and flows, but now we have this intermediate time step here called the computation increment. The computation increment is the actual time step we use to do the sediment transport computations. And it turns out that RAS is pretty sensitive to this because RAS assumes no bed change over the entire computation increment. So if too much bed change happens in a particular computation increment, the model can go unstable. So the rule of thumb is that the more bed change you have going on or the higher flow, because those things are correlated, the smaller computation increment you want. And so we could go in and just say, okay, we want six hours of we want six hour computation increments for all of these. And so what that'll do is for each of these daily flows, it'll split it into four individual computations. But the other thing you can do is that you can assign computation increment based on the flow. The idea is that the higher the flow is, the more computational resolution you want through there to resolve smaller bed changes. And so we're going to go in and click this Compute Computational Increment Based on Flow option. And what that'll do is that'll automate this middle column. And we're gonna use this chart right here. We're gonna say for flows between 10 and 100 cubic meters per second, we're gonna use a computational increment of six. But between 100 and 1,000, we're gonna use a computational increment of one hour. And you can see how up here, it's populating those numbers. And then up to about 4,500, we'll use a 30 minute computation increment. And then above that, let's say up to about 8,000. We need to make sure that the top flow is higher than the biggest flow we're gonna experience. We'll go down to 0 0.2. So one question that would obviously emerge from this is how do you know what time steps to choose? And that's actually a difficult question that we could cover in more detail later, but a couple of rules of thumb. One is you wanna think about essentially a sediment current condition. You want the sediment to be moving between cross sections in approximately one time step. But more commonly we use a convergence test where we just reduce the time step until we don't see change. And then we know that we've kind of hit a stable time step. All right, and then the one other thing we want to do is we want to set a fixed start time. You can use the simulation time, and that'll actually just inherit the time from your plan. But it's always better to use a fixed start time because if you know where the data are in time, then you can actually move a computational window over them using the plan editor. And so we know that these data start in July 1st, 1975. And, and RAS always uses this format, the day, day, month, 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 year, 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 year format. And it always also has to be set to English settings. One of the reasons that RAS often doesn't work on international machines is that the date setting is different. And so you actually have to go in and change your date setting to use RAS. Um, future versions will avoid that pitfall. And then the time is 0000. zero, zero, zero. And so then we can say, okay, and we have our flow series. And if we plot it, you can see here's our hydrograph. And you can see the difference between a quasi unsteady flow hydrograph and a unsteady flow hydrograph. In fact, sometimes we call these quasi unsteady flow data a histograph because it's just a series of sub steady flows. And each one of these flows will be broken down into sub time steps based on how many computational increments we have. The smallest will be broken into four because we have a six hour computation increment. And these will be broken into 24 individual time steps because we have a one hour computation increment. Now we have our upstream boundary condition. Next, we're gonna do our downstream boundary condition. Our, and for our downstream boundary condition, we're just gonna use a normal depth boundary condition. You'll see if we click on this downstream node, we have three different downstream boundary conditions available to us. They're all some sort of stage boundary condition. Normal depth is popular because it's the easiest. It can also cause you some problems in a sediment transport model, so you have to be careful with it, but we're going to start with it. 
and so we'll go to normal depth and normal depth just computes the stage at the downstream boundary condition using Manning's equation. All Manning's equation needs in order to do this is a friction slope. And so we're going to put in a friction slope that we got basically just by regressing the bed slope. Um, and it's going to be 0 0.0003. Okay, so we have all of our boundary conditions that we need, except sediment transport also needs temperature data. Temperature data can be important in sediment transport because temperature affects the viscosity of the water, which affects both fall velocity and transport. And so we need temperature data for any sediment transport analysis. And so this set temperature button is actually mandatory. You have to press it and open the temperature editor. And a lot of times it's very useful to have temperature that changes over time. Um, we may do a video on just the different ways to do temperature data, but here we've just got a constant temperature. It's a constant temperature of 13 degrees Celsius. So there's a couple ways you can do this. You could just put in a very large time step and put in your temperature, or you could go in, just go ahead and put in your, tw your 24 hour duration and keep it constant and put in your fixed starting time and your temperature data is set. All right, then we will file save quasi and steady flow file and we will call this a 100 day hydrograph and we finished the first step that is the first step in creating a sediment transport model we have finished the quasi unsteady flow hydrograph you'll see that we have now have a quasi unsteady flow file which is a q file q01 and in the next video we'll take the next step and generate a sediment transport file